Hello to all the learners and viewers of Gyan Darshan. Myself, Dr. Ravi Rajwanshi, Associate Professor from Discipline of Life Sciences, School of Sciences, IGNO. Today I am going to talk about a very interesting topic of recombinant DNA technology, which is from the B course of BSc General. The name of the course is Economic Botany and Biotechnology bearing the code BBYET143. So coming to the topic, in my previous lecture I have discussed about biotechnology, what are the different types of biotechnology. In those lecture I have specifically highlighted the modern biotechnology for which the backbone for this technology is recombinant DNA technology. So what is actually recombinant DNA technology? So recombinant DNA technology from the name you can see that it says something about recombination means you are bringing something together from different sources. So you are recombining. So if I have to define recombinant DNA technology it is the process of constructing and manipulating DNA sequences that do not occur naturally by combining DNA fragments from different sources. So what are basically steps which are involved in recombinant DNA technology? So if I have to recombine different fragments of DNA from different organisms, first thing is I have to have a gene of interest. That gene of interest has to be isolated from that particular organism. Then it has to be followed by its cloning. So for that you need to have some type of vector. We will be discussing what are the vectors basically. So you need certain type of vectors which will carry those gene of interest into the host cell. At the time of cloning you can also clone different regulatory elements. For example, you can clone a inducible or a strong promoter that can, so you can have a control on the expression of that gene as per your requirement. So once this recombinant DNA is transformed into any organism that becomes a genetically modified organism. So what is genetically modified organism? If I have to define an organism whose genetic material has been modified, for example, by introducing a foreign DNA sequence obtained by recombinant DNA technology. Now, this organism can be an animal, can be a plant, and any animal or a plant which is having a DNA from some other organism, they are called as transgenic animals or transgenic plants. So they have genetic elements from foreign sources. And these genetic elements basically provides that particular organism, transgenic or organism, a novel trait or character which is for the benefit of human mankind. Need not to say that all these technologies are strongly regulated by different biosafety laws and guidelines. So if I have to speak about recombination of DNA, the first question is that how we are going to recombine these small biomolecules which are almost impossible to see by naked eyes. So you need certain tools to cut the DNA you need certain enzymes to join the DNA. So for understanding the recombinant DNA technology, the first thing we have to understand is the role of restriction enzymes. What are these restriction enzymes? These restriction enzymes are the molecular scissors. So we, why we call it a molecular scissors? Because these restriction enzymes can cleave DNA or any recognition sequence, for example, these recognition sequences are called restriction sites in a 
DNA sequences. So they can identify these restriction sites and they can cut at a particular restriction site. So these enzymes can make one incision on each of the two strands of the DNA. As we know the DNA is a double helical structure, so it will make an incision on both the strands. And these enzymes are also called as restriction endonucleases. So, there is an interesting history or a background that how these basically restriction enzymes were actually identified. As we know that viruses have the capability to hijack the host machinery in such a way that they integrate their own DNA into the host machinery and they propagate or multiply their own progeny. And this can result to the death of the cell. To overcome the viral infection, these organisms like bacteria and archaea have evolved several mechanisms. Why they have developed this mechanism? To safeguard themselves from the invading viruses. So, how they actually protect themselves from the invading virus? They have these restriction enzymes in their own cells which can actually diff can identify the self and the non-self DNA. So the mechanism behind identification of the self and non-self DNA is possible because of the enzyme which is present in these bacteria called as methylases. These methylases basically they methylate the bases like adenine or cytosine within the host recognition sequences. So each of the restriction enzyme which is present in the host cell have its corresponding methylase means every restriction enzyme has its own corresponding methylase and its own methylation pattern and this basically gives the protection to the host DNA from degradation. So these enzymes make up the restriction modification, in short we called as RM systems. Now coming to the classification of restriction and endonucleases, restriction enzymes can be classified into four types based upon their subunit composition cleavage position, sequence specificity and cofactor requirements. The first type of enzyme is called the type 1 enzyme. They are complex multi subunit combination restriction and modification enzymes that cut DNA at random far from the recognition site. So you can see that these class 1 enzymes they recognize a sequence recognition sequence but they cut at a far distance what at how much distance it is approximately about 1000 base pair away from the recognition site so you can see these recognition sites are approximately of 15 base pair of you can say length some of the examples for type 1 enzymes are eco b and eco k next is type 2 enzymes. These type 2 enzymes are the most popular enzymes which are widely used in recombinant DNA technology. They cut the DNA at defined position either to close or within the recognition sequences. So that makes them most popular enzymes used in recombinant DNA technology. Few of the examples are HHA1, HIN3, NOT1, or and eco R1. Next comes is the type 3 enzymes. These type 3 enzymes are also large combination restriction and modification enzymes. They cleave at the site 25 to 27 base pair from the recognition site, means approximately 25 to 27 base pair away from the recognition site. So it also requires two such sequences in opposite direction. 
or opposite orientation within the same DNA molecule to accomplish this cleavage. So their requirement is more complex compared to the type 1 or type 2 enzyme. So they because of this requirement they rarely give a complete digest in the gel. So some of the example for this type of enzyme is eco P1 and HIM3. Next comes is type 4 enzymes. These enzymes, the best example for this enzyme is MCRBC. This type of enzyme basically act on a DNA which is modified. What type of modifications it basically identifies? The DNA it is identifying is either methylated or hydroxymethylated or glucosyl hydroxymethylated DNA. So these enzymes are very less popular compared to the type 2 enzymes discussed just now. Now another important component for a recombinant DNA technology is vectors. So vectors what are these vectors are basically used for cloning purpose. What are the vectors or the, you can say what are the cloning vectors? So cloning vector is a genome that can accept the target DNA and increase the number of copies through its own autonomous replication. Means a vector when it is transformed into a host cell, it also multiplies along with the host cells and its number increases, the copy increases. So these vectors are very important for DNA recombinant technology because when we clone a gene of interest in these vectors, they also multiply equally as the multiplication of a vector in a host cell. So vectors can be divided into two types based upon their role in this technology. The first one is cloning vector. The second one is the expression vector. Now they are coming to cloning vectors. Let's first understand what are the cloning vectors. Cloning vectors are the DNA molecules that deliver a specific gene of interest into a host cell. So their primary goal is to replicate the inserted gene as many times as possible. So as I have discussed just now, when you clone a gene of interest into a vector and you transform these vectors or insert these vectors into the host cell, with the multiplication of the host cells, the number of the vector inside the host cell also multiplies along with the gene of interest. So there are certain important characters that has to be fulfilled by a good cloning vector. The first character is its size. A good cloning vector is the one which is small in size because if you use a bigger size vector, it will be difficult to take up by the host cell. Moreover, it will act as a, it will give a more load on the host cell and difficult to be taken up. So it's good if the size of the vector is as small as possible without compromising its role what is meant for. Now it should also be self-replicating. For this vectors are usually having origin of replication. In short we called it as, as ORI. So this help the vector to self-replicate inside the host. Apart from this you need to clone a gene of interest. For cloning a gene of interest you need to have a multiple cloning site. These multiple cloning sites are the restriction sites which are identified by different restriction endonucleases. <coughs> so vectors are basically designed in such a way so that more options of uh, cloning sites are given there so that you have a flexibility to design the cloning strategy as per your need. Moreover, the vector should also be such that after cloning a gene of interest, 
it should not interfere with the properties of the vector or its replication. Apart from this, you also need to have a marker gene in a vector. Why we need a marker gene? These marker genes basically help us to select the host cells which are transformed compared to the one which are not transformed. Usually, these marker genes are some types of antibiotic resistance gene. For example, there is a canamycin resistance gene or ampicillin resistance gene or hygromycin resistance gene. So, if you have a particular antibiotic present in the media, you will be able to select the cells which are actually transformed or taken up though that particular vector in that cell. So, these resistance genes provide resistance against that antibiotic, whereas the cells which are not transformed will eventually die. So, there are different cloning vectors. First, let us discuss something about the prokaryotic vectors. We know that prokaryotic system is comparatively a simpler system compared to a eukaryotic system. And of course, to start with, is always good to start with a system which is less complex. So, prokaryotic vectors includes plasmids, bacteriophages, phagmids, and phosmids. So, these plasmids are basically the most popular one, which were the starting, you can say, the vectors which was started first was the plasmid only. These plasmids are the self-replicating double-stranded circular DNA molecules which are found in bacteria that are extra chromosomal entities. So, it has a, its own genome, but apart from this, this extra, extra chromosomal DNA which is present in bacteria is the plasmid. Some of the plasmids, well-known plasmids are PBR322, PBR327, PUC8, PUC18, PUC19. So, the question comes, what actually is how these vectors, they get their names. In this particular example of like PBR322, the small p stands for plasmid, BR stands for the the researchers or the scientists who have actually developed it. In this case, the, it is Bolivar and Roderick. In PUC18 and PUC19, where UC basically stands for University of California, where this vector was developed. So, this is how the nomenclature of these vectors is done. <coughs> Here, you can see in the slide the schematic representation of the plasmid containing different regions. Here in the slide you can see in this plasmid DNA you will find a restriction site. Here you can see a green arrow and this is a green arrow and you can see this is the region which is the restriction sites and between these restriction sites the gene of interest is actually cloned. So, this is the gene of interest which is shown here. Apart from this, there is a promoter. This promoter basically regulates the expression of this gene of interest. So, you can design a strategy and choose an appropriate promoter at the time of cloning that how your gene should be expressed, where it should be expressed. So, this can be controlled by choosing an appropriate promoter. Apart from this, here is the antibiotic resistance gene. This antibiotic resistance, I have just now explained that how these can also be used as a selectable marker. Some of the plasmids have two antibiotic resistance genes so that you have more flexibility of using different types of select, uh, selection markers as per the need. This is the origin of replication, which I have just now told that it is important for self-replication of the plasmid in the host cell. <coughs> Now coming to another vector which is here you can see it is a bacteriophage. The name of this bacteriophage is M13 MP18. Here you can see a black portion which is a polylinker portion. This polylinker portion is basically utilized for cloning the gene of interest. Apart from this you can see 
this red portion this is a promoter or the operator portion and this is the m13 genome in green so a single break in the phage linear dna molecule can generate suppose this dna is a linear molecule if you put a you cleave this dna once what will result it will result into two fragments which are later joined with the help of foreign dna to form a chimeric phage par particle now the capacity of the phage head as you know that phage head phage itself is a very small you can say uh, organism but we have to transfer these genetic material into the phage head which is very limited and a small amount of foreign dna can only be inserted into it so lambda genome is packaged inside the phage head by what is known as head full mechanism so the non essential part of the genome can be utilized in this case this is the polylinker site where you can actually clone the foreign dna whereas if you clone a dna at any other position will actually fail the vector from doing its job so you have to clone your gene of interest at a non essential region and in this case it is that polylinker site now comes another vector which is called cosmic cosmid vector this was developed by j collins and co-workers in 1978 this vector facilitate the cloning of larger dna fragments approximately about 85 kb kilobase pair then compared to what plasmid can actually do and hence it can be used for establishing the gene library so you can see the technology keeps on advancing and new vectors were developed as per the requirement since the bigger fragments has to be cloned different vectors were designed and in the series this cosmic vector was also developed the cosmic vector is made up of plasmid and bacteriophage sequences this cosmic is actually are the plasmids only that contain the lambda cos or you can say a causative end sites that are or that are the lambda sequences required for the packaging of dna into the lambda phage particles so for packaging of this type of dna there is a need of this type of causative ends that is called lambda cos site the common used cosmid vector is plf r5 which is about 6 kb in size and it contains two bacteriophage cos sites that can get cleaved during the packaging of the phage and as a result the cos ends base pair forms a circular dna molecule inside the bacteria so coming to another vector which is called as phosmid phosmid are also the cloning vector with a low copy number sometimes our requirement is that we need a low copy number vectors and this was developed based upon f vector plasmid so the cosmic cloning system this type of co cosmic cloning system actually has the f factor origin of replication means it has the origin of replication from f factor and this is a very important factor which actually controls the copy number of the vector means we do not ne need excess copies and hence this particular factor helps to control the copy number of the vector this type of vector is used for genomic library construction of complex genomes coming to eukaryotic vectors as i have told earlier 
that prokaryotes are comparatively simple system but sometimes we need the complex system to work as we know that the processing of the protein or glycosylation that take place in eukaryotic cells might be a requirement in some of the experiments so sometimes we also need bigger fragments to be cloned and the prokaryotic vectors are not capable of taking up the bigger fragments and here we need sometimes the use of eukaryotic vectors some of the examples for eukaryotic vectors are yeast artificial chromosome in short we called it as yaks then mammalian artificial chromosome in short we called it max and these are based upon yeast and human centromere telomere sequences and autonomously replicating sequences apart from this there are certain plant viruses also which can be used as a vector for example cauliflower mosaic virus in short we call it as camv tobacco mosaic virus in short we called it as tmv and gemini virus also there are certain animal viruses also which can be used as a vectors for example baculovirus adenovirus papovirus herpes virus and retrovirus another important example of a vector is ti plasmid this ti plasmid basically induces uh, tumor or crown gall in dicots and it is caused by the bacteria named as agrobacterium tumefaciens whereas another plasmid is called ri plasmid which actually induces hairy roots under natural conditions and this is basically caused by a bacterium called agrobacterium rhizogenes and these vectors they are present or you can say used basically to infect the higher plants both ti and ri plasmids are actually the part of plasmid dna which is called tdna and this is transferred into the plant genome due to the presence of another gene which is called vir gene which is responsible for its virulence now coming to this diagrammatic representation of both ti plasmid and ri plasmid here you can see that there are certain genes which are present this is a natural representation where you can see a left border in yellow and a right border in a yellow this is a tvi plasmid similarly in ri plasmid also you can see a left border as well as a right border and in between you find the genes coding for auxin cytokinin and opin similarly you can see the same condition in ri plasmid whereas you can see a virulence gene which is outside the border and this is actually responsible for infection of a host plant cell by the agrobacterium in addition to this you can also see the origin of replication for its self replication so this is the overall structure of ti plasmid and ri plasmid which are widely used for the transformation of plants or the development of the transgenic plants next comes the expression vectors so we have already discussed the cloning vectors what are these actually the expression vectors expression vectors are basically a type of you can say a cloning vector only but these vectors are used in genetic engineering that enables a particular gene to be cloned as well as express in a host cell the expression vector is constructed to contain appropriate regulatory sequences so that the host cell machinery can transcribe a gene and translate the resultant mrna to synthesize the corresponding protein as we know the central dogma of molecular biology dna transcribed to the rna and rna is translated to the protein so any change in the dna will finally result in the final product maybe if it is a protein 
So, in recombinant DNA technology, we basically manipulate the DNA so that we can get the trait or the character of required character in an organism or a cell. Now, these expression vectors may be designed in such a way that they have to have some expression signals such as it should have a strong promoter and operator, it should have a strong termination codon, it should have an appropriate distance between the promoter and the clone gene so that it can be expressed properly, it should have a transcription termination sequence and it should have a portable translation initiation sequence. So he, the requirement is comparatively more in an expression system because here, after cloning, we also require the product. So, the gene has to be translated to a protein also. So, cloning and expression vectors can both replicate on their own within the host cell. So, this is the beauty of both the vectors. Now, comes another vector which is called shuttle vector. Now, the word shuttle, like you have already well-known word shuttlecock in badminton. So, it goes from one place to another and comes back like that. So, you can see that here a vector is also known as shuttle vector. Why, why we need these shuttle vectors? Let's discuss the same. A set shuttle vector is a vector that can propagate in two different host species. Means, it can work very well even in a prokaryotic system or it can also work in a eukaryotic system. So, hence the inserted DNA can be tested or manipulated in two different cell types. The main advantage of these vectors is that they can be manipulated in E. coli and then used in a system which is more difficult or comparatively you can say a slower system. So, shuttle vector can be used both in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. One of the most common type of shuttle vector which is used is yeast shuttle vector that contains components that allow for the replication and selection in both E. coli cells and yeast cells. The E. coli component of the yeast shuttle vector includes the origin of replication and selectable markers such as antibiotic resistance genes like beta lactamase and it also contains a yeast component which is having autonomously replicating sequences in short it is called ARS or a yeast centromere in short it is called as CEN and a yeast selectable marker. So, here you can see a diagrammatic representation of a shuttle vector where can use, you can see a yeast origin of replication as well as a bacterial origin of replication. You can see a bacterial selectable marker. You can also see a yeast selectable marker as well as the origin of transfer. So, you can see this vector has all the important components, uh, uh, the sequences that will enable it to work successfully in both the system and hence called shuttle vector. Now, here is a summary, a short summary where you can see the properties of well-known vectors. In the table, you can see that as per the requirement of a scientist or a researcher, we have to select the appropriate vector, appropriate host cell, and a, the length of fragment which we are actually going to clone in a particular vector and what are the important features of that vector. So, you can see there are different types of vectors. For example, plasmate is there, bacteriophages, phagemate is there, back, uh, back that is bacterial artificial chromosome. So, they have their own prefer preferred host cell where you can actually uh, insert these vectors for multiplication. Here you can see the different insert sizes, 
what type of length of the gene of interest or the DNA fragment they can actually accommodate and these are the unique features which are actually uh, uh, available with the different types of vectors. Here also the list continues where you can see the P1 derived artificial chromosomes that is PACs, then yeast artificial chromosome that is YACs, then cosmids, human artificial chromosomes like HAC HAC. So these are the different types of vectors and their preferred host which you can select and work according to your requirement. Now coming to gene cloning. Since the overall purpose of studying different components of these DNA recombinant technology is that that final aim is to clone a gene. So to clone a gene there are certain steps to be followed. What are those steps? The first step is the isolation of the DNA. Here the isol DNA means actually the gene of interest or DNA fragment which is of gene of interest we want to clone. Then second is the insertion of the isolated DNA into a suitable vector as I have already explained. After this once the gene of interest is cloned in a suitable vector it has to be transformed into a uh, this transformation of recombinant DNA because now you have recombined the vector with the gene of interest so it is called recombinant DNA. Now this recombinant DNA has to be transferred into a suitable host cell. Once it is transformed into a host cell next comes the selection process. Now you have to select the process based upon the markers gene present in the vector. So accordingly you have to go for selection process and then you have to see or check the multiplication or the expression of the clone gene of interest in the host cell. Whether the gene is able to express or it is not able to express. Whether it is able to multiply or it is not able to multiply. <coughs> so isolation of <coughs> multiple copies of gene or protein expressed in the microorganism by the cloned gene of interest. So you have to isolate whatever is the output of that clone gene which has been successfully expressed. Usually it is a protein. In this diagram you can see the various steps involved in molecular cloning. In short what I have just now explained you can see here there is a E. coli which is a bacteria has a plasmid there. You have to isolate the DNA from both the sources whether it is a E. coli or suppose in this case it is a human cell DNA. So we have isolated the gene of interest from the human. So there is a gene of interest. Now you cut the DNA of E. coli plasmid as well as this gene of interest in such a way that the flanking ends are compatible to each other. So that when this is mixed with the vector the sticky ends are in such a way that it can easily go and bind to those flanking ends. So here you can see once it is successfully mixed so DNA you will find a vector which is containing a gene of interest. Now this gene of interest along with the recombinant DNA plasmid is transferred into a host cell which is a bacterium here again. So you can see the difference earlier this bacterium was having a plasmid without gene of interest whereas now it has a plasmid with gene of interest and now when this is plated on a media the bacteria multiplies and in the course of multiplication the vector and gene of interest also multiplies. So we have another technique called PCR polymerase chain reaction. We know that this is a technique where we actually mimic the replication which is actually done in a natural condition in a bacteria but we provide those conditions but in this a small fragment of the DNA can be multiplied by following a set of conditions using the appropriate primers. Here you can see the primer 1, primer 2. This is the double stranded DNA. So once we denature the double stranded DNA, 
we add the primers. These primers are complementary to the strand of the DNA. So they bind at the appropriate position. With the action of DNA polymerase, what happens? With the ad addition this of DNTPs in the reaction mixture, the bases are added as per the bases present on the parent DNA. And this DNA polymerase makes the copy of the parent DNA. So this copy is made for both the strands. And in this way, after the extension, we get good number of copies of the gene or a fragment of interest which we wanted to multiply. And the same thing basically occurs in the bacteria also, where we put the plasmid DNA. And here, when the bacteria multiplies, it also multiplies and we get a good amount of plasmid DNA. Now coming to selection process. How to select? The one of the selection process is the blue-white selection. How this blue-white selection actually work? In short, I am going to explain that there is a fragment of gene which is present or cloned in a plasmid vector. If your foreign DNA is cloned in that particular location, that is the lac Z, lac Z. So this green portion here you can see is the lac Z. If you can clone this in uh, this fragment into this portion, and then you have to find out that whether this particular fragment has been cloned or not, or whether it has been transformed into, into the bacterial colony or not. So for this, there is a short reaction basically which occurs. If this insert is within the lag Z, what will happen? There will be an inducer which is called as IPTG which is present. In the presence of the X gal, if you culture these colonies and there is uh, basically you can say there is insert within the lag Z, then you will get white colonies. If you insert, if your insert is outside the lag Z, what will happen? This particular lag Z gene will express and the product of this lag Z gene will react with the X gal and finally it will result into a blue colonies. So this will give you a hint that there is an insert which is not actually present between the lag Z gene. Or there could be another example where there is no insert. In this case also you will find the blue colonies. So, in this type of selection, what we basically look for, if the experiment has been properly designed and your gene of interest has successfully cloned in the lag Z portion, you will get the white colonies, whereas otherwise you will get the blue colonies. So, this is the blue-white selection. Another selection procedure is the antibiotic sensitivity assay. As discussed in the previous slide only, if you have a vector which is having a resistance gene for a particular antibiotic, for here, for example, this is like ampicillin resistance gene, APR, which is present. Here also you can see a ampicillin resistance gene. But the difference in the two is that here we have an insert and hence this complete vector is a circular vector along with the gene of interest whereas there is no insert in the other and this is a linear or you can say a cut vector. So when you transform these vectors into a host cell what you will find because of the functional gene of ampicillin resistance and your plate is having the ampicillin the colonies which are or the cells which are actually transformed can actually survive on the ampicillin plate. Whereas here this ampicillin resistance gene is non-functional because it is cut or open and hence in the presence of ampicillin you will find no colonies. So in this way you can select the host 
cells or the colonies which are actually transformed compared to those host cells which are not transformed. Coming to another example, like in the previous slide, I was discussing about selection of the colonies. Now, here I am discussing about the selection of the putative transgenics. Suppose you have su successfully developed a transgenic plant after, like in this diagram, you can see there is a DNA isolated with a target gene. It has been, target gene has been cloned in a TI plasmid. Then it has been transformed into agrobacterium cell. This agrobacterium cell basically goes and infect the plant cell. Okay, so what will it happen? What, what, what will occur there? The tDNA part will go and integrate into the genome of the plant. So your tDNA portion, you have to design a strategy in such a way that your tDNA portion should also have a selection marker gene along with the gene of interest. In case you have an antibiotic resistance gene cloned along with the gene of interest, what you can do? On the culture plate, you can grow the callus or the explant and this plate is having that antibiotic. The presence of antibiotic resistance gene will protect these explants from dying. And hence you can say these are the putative transgenics which is also having the gene of interest. Later on, they are confirmed by various molecular biology techniques like Southern, Northern, Western or PCR. So, so to confirm the presence of gene of interest also, but this initial selection is very important for putative selection of the transgenics. Now, here is another selection method where you can use eukaryotic system where you can use both positive as well as negative selection system. In this diagram, you can see there is a presence of URA3 gene, which actually produce OMP decarboxylase. And this OMP decarboxylase results into the formation of a toxic compound, which is fluorodeoxyuridine, which is toxic. So, if this URA3 gene do not have any gene of interest and the colonies are basically grown. So the, you will find that due to this toxic compound, no colony will be formed. Whereas if you clone a gene of interest here, then this is disrupted and finally you will have a non-functional OMP decarboxylase gene and you can see the colonies on this growth of these colonies on the plate. So, it depends upon, for example, there is another example, an autotrophic mutant with a non-functional LU2 gene. This LU2 gene basically helps in the synthesis of leucine. So, the transformants can grow on a minimum media, means if the gene is present in the mutant, it can allow the growth of the cells on the minimum media which is heavy which, hence you do not have to add leucine to the media due to the presence of leu2 gene in the vector so these are some of the examples of positive as well as negative selection here is another example of transgenic plants where you can use a reporter gene which are visible this i have taken from my own research uh, study of psd here you can see there are certain reporter genes like GFP which you can visualize as a green fluorescence protein or in this case here it is a GUS gene which has been used in the transformation process while developing transgenics. So you can see the blue color which, say, which tells you that these particular portion of the chimeric plant organs are actually having the gene of interest as well as the reporter gene, whereas the white portion is actually lacking those genes. So these are the visual reporter genes which you can use also for screening method. Apart from this, you have a PCR technique. This PCR technique 
where I have discussed in the previous slide, you can use appropriate primers for our gene of interest and you can finally amplify that gene of interest if present will get amplified. In this picture you can see this is the original gel picture where you can see M is the molecular ladder means it tells you the size and based comparing to this molecular ladder you can compare the size of these fragments which have been amplified. So you can see in negative there is no amplification means there is no gene of interest whereas wherever you find these bands means that is having gene of interest and has been amplified by the technique of PCR. Now coming to the application of the recombinant DNA technology based upon the pre, uh, uh, whatever we have discussed in this lecture you can see there is an enormous role to play by uh, the recombinant DNA technology in various fields for example this technology can be used for the development of therapeutic products it can be used for the development of vaccines it can be used for the development of growth hormones antibodies you can use the vectors for other uh, aspects in medical sciences for example gene therapy this technology can also be used in a more latest and advanced technology of CRISPR this can also be used for as a monitoring devices apart from this you can use this technology for the development of genetically modified fruits vegetables crops microbes and animals apart from this you can also use this technology for biohydrogen production of biohydrogen bioethanol biomethanol butanol so dear learners in this lecture i have discussed with you the different components of recombinant DNA technology along with its application in the field of biotechnology and I hope in my future lecture I will be discussing many of these technologies much in detail. So I suggest you to go through your SLMs, read those SLMs properly and so that you will be able to understand the techniques which are required in the field of biotechnology in a proper way. So I am going to end up my lecture now. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Young